Okay, this is a review for Unit 3 of Physical Science 100, and it covers material from the second law of thermodynamics, all the chemistry material, and the nuclear processes material. A lot of this is going to involve um, showing you what would be clicker questions in class. What I recommend you do as you play this back is as I ask each of these questions or bring them up, you try to answer it yourself and then I'm going to tell you in, uh, the answer. So what you should do when the questions come up is pause the video and then try to answer the question and then I'll answer it. So let's dig into it. This asks which of these processes is reversible? And you can see the question. What's the right answer to this? Well, let's see. Reversibility would involve a phase change at the normal temperature of the phase change. So melting of ice at zero degrees should be a reversible process. Uh, so A is the correct answer. Melting at 100 degrees is not a reversible process. If ice melts at, its, at the water boiling point, it won't ever refreeze. Likewise, uh, if you scramble an egg, you can't unscramble the egg, and you can't unpop a balloon. Let's move to the next question. This asks about what happens to the total amount of entropy in a reversible process. Go ahead and answer it. Okay, the best answer to this is C, the total amount of entropy stays the same. You may have been tempted to answer A, that it's zero, but remember what the second law of thermodynamics says is that the entropy of the universe always increases in any real process. It doesn't stay zero, it just doesn't change if you have uh, a reversible process that changes zero. And it never becomes infinite either. So reversibility is the one special case where the amount of entropy doesn't increase, it just stays the same. Next question. All right, this one asks you to rank these various different kinds of energy in terms of how disordered they are. And um, we showed you a list of these in class, but really the only one you really need to know is the most disordered one is always B, ambient temperature thermal energy, because that means the energy is completely scrambled and randomly uh, organized. So keep in mind, that's the important one. Ordered forms of energy involve things like large objects moving because all the particles in the object have to move together. Uh, so macroscopic kinetic energy is a very ordered kind of energy, whereas ambient temperature thermal energy is very disordered. Uh, the others you can debate about where they go. We're not going to ask you that kind of question. Um, we saw in one of the chapters that there are a bunch of ways for measuring molecular structures and x-ray diffraction is one of the very best for figuring out the structures of molecules, that is where the atoms are in molecules. You remember we talked about diffraction and interference before and we pointed out that diffraction and interference are only observed when the objects causing the diffraction or interference uh, are about the same size as the wavelength of the radiation that's, that's uh, diffracting or interfering. And atoms and x-ray wavelengths are about the same size, so atoms and x-rays are a pretty good match for seeing diffraction and interference. So what do waves do when they encounter objects about the same size as their wavelength? They diffract or interfere. And what happens in this uh, picture here is there's a little crystal mounted on the end of a needle. You can see the shadow of the needle in the image and you shine x-rays through it and those x-rays diffract through the crystal and interfere and where there's constructive interference you get bright spots and from that pattern of bright spots if you analyze it carefully using some very sophisticated math you can calculate the positions of the atoms in the crystal that uh, caused the interference pattern that is observed. And that's a very powerful method for determining molecular structure. Another way you can do it is using mass spectrometry, and we talked about this in class. Um, so in a mass spectrum, it's a plot of 
masses across the bottom axis of the graph versus the relative number of molecules that are observed that have that particular mass on the y-axis. So this is the mass spectrum for aspirin. Aspirin has the chemical formula C9O4H8. And if you add up the atomic weights of each of those atoms, we talked about doing that in class. You remember hydrogen has an atomic weight of 1, carbon has an atomic weight of 12, oxygen, the red balls, have an atomic weight of 16. If you add those all up, you'll find that this formula will give you a total weight of 180 atomic mass units. And sure enough, over here in the mass spectrum, there's a peak at 180, which is an intact molecule of aspirin. But when you put molecules into an instrument like this, they don't normally stay intact. They break, and so these other peaks are due to various fragments. For instance, this one at mass 44 is a carbon with two oxygens circled in blue over here. And this next one is this piece of the molecule shown in yellow. And this next one is another way of breaking it. It's the red piece shown there. And that's how mass spectrometry works. And you can, it's like putting together a puzzle. You look at the peaks you get in the mass spectrum and then go back and piece together what the molecule had to have been. So these are fun problems to solve, and this is my field of research. <clears throat> Another way we can figure out molecular structure is by looking at the light that the molecules absorb. Um, so again, this is um, a, a, called an infrared spectrum of uh, aspirin. And what it measures is how much of the infrared light goes through the molecule as a function of the wavelength or the energy of the vibrations in the molecule. And notice that there are places where almost all the light goes through, where the transmittance is 100%. And there are places where nearly all the light is getting absorbed here. These, this is a strong absorption circled in blue. And there are other peaks down here. Well, this pattern of absorption and transmission, called an infrared spectrum, really gives you a fingerprint for the molecule. So every molecule has a unique pattern of peaks like this. And certain peaks are always associated with um, certain structural features in molecules. For instance, this carbon double bonded to oxygen produces peaks uh, around here. Let's see, it's about um, 1,700 wave numbers and 1,800 wave numbers. Wave numbers are just measures of the um, absorption frequencies. Don't worry about the details of that. And don't try to memorize you know, which peaks give which or correspond to which features. You don't need to know that. But what you should be able to do is look at a set of spectra and say, oh, all of these molecules have this C double bond O, and all of their spectra have this particular peak, so that must be associated. And, I mean, that's what you do here. So um, aspirin has a couple of these C double bond O groups, and that accounts for the peaks that we see in the spectrum. And all these other peaks are due to other things that are in the aspirin molecule, which we won't worry about. Uh, we talked about catalysis a little bit in uh, the chapter on chemical reactivity, and this is just a reminder of that. Um, what catalysts do is they are compounds uh, or chemical substances that participate in chemical reactions, but they are not used up in the chemical reaction. In other words, they participate and then they come back at the end. An example of that is this decomposition of hydrogen peroxide, which is shown um, on this reaction coordinate diagram. Remember on these diagrams, what's plotted on the x-axis is just a measure of how far along the reaction has progressed. And what's plotted on the y-axis is potential energy. So in this particular reaction, we have um, hydrogen peroxide, the stuff that you bleach your hair blonde with. And uh, hydrogen peroxide is unstable. It reacts with uh, acid, with, with H plus here, and breaks down to become water and oxygen. 
and it turns out that this compound, which is called bromide, is a catalyst for this reaction. So the reaction will happen, um, and it's downhill in energy, so that's, that means it's thermodynamically a favorable reaction. But normally it doesn't happen very fast because in order for the reaction to, have, to happen, you have to break some bonds in the peroxide and that costs energy. So if you don't use a catalyst, the activation energy is high and the reaction is slow. Remember, what governs the speed of a reaction is this activation energy and also the entropy that's required if the molecules have to be oriented in a particular way in order for a reaction to happen. So if you don't have a catalyst present, then the reaction is pretty slow. But if you have bromide present, you get this blue pathway instead. It's a lower energy pathway because the, the bromide helps to um, organize the peroxide and the hydrogen ions just right so that the reaction can take place. And that's a lower energy way of getting to the products, but in the process of doing that, the bromide is regenerated at the end, so it's not used up. And that's what a catalyst does. It makes low energy routes for reactions possible. And this is extremely important because our bodies depend on catalysis for the chemistry of life to happen at normal temperatures. Remember, another way to speed up a reaction is just to make everything hotter. But if you do that to a human, that's uh, not very good for a lot of the things in a, in a human being or any other living thing. And uh, so catalysts that make the reactions go faster at room temperature are essential for life and also in industry and lots of other things. In the chemistry sections, we talked about the properties of various different kinds of compounds. So there was a chapter about metals. Let's talk about metals for a minute. Remember that metals are things that are on the left side of the periodic table, left of that diagonal line you see over on the right. And metals all tend to be network solids. That is, the atoms are arranged in, in ordered arrays in crystals. Metals are malleable and ductile. That means that you can hammer the metal into a flat sheet or you can pull it out into a thin wire. And the reason that they're that way is because of their chemical structure. It's because when you put the atoms of a metal together, um, you get many orbitals that are very close together in energy. And we call that the valence band. And remember that in a metal, the valence band is not full, which means that there are always empty orbitals that are easy for electrons to get into. They're not high energy, and that means that the electrons can switch orbitals. They can move around through the metal very easily. That's what makes the metals malleable and ductile, because if you hammer the metal flat, well, of course, the atoms move when you do that, but the mobile electrons can easily move right along with the atoms to adapt to changes in positions of the nuclei, and that, so that means metals are easy to shape. Metals are both opaque and shiny, because they have this orbital structure with lots of closely spaced energy levels. There's always an energy level difference between one where an electron is and an empty one that corresponds to the energy of a photon, and so photons of all wavelengths get absorbed by the metal. Metals are shiny for the same reason, because an electron that's in an excited orbital in that metal can always fall to a lower energy orbital. Um, there's always an empty one available it can move into, and that means that the, the photon is re-emitted, so uh, photons hit the metal, get absorbed, and then are re-emitted, and that's what makes it shiny. Metals are good electrical conductors. And again, the reason is that the valence band is not full, and that means that the orbitals are spread out and that the electrons can easily move around in the metals. That's, and of course, electrical conductivity is the movement of charge through a material, and that's very easy for uh, metals. Metals have high melting and boiling points, and the reason for that is that those atoms in the metal, even though the electrons can move around easily, um, 
those atoms are bound to each other very strongly and that's why the melting and boiling points are high. You have to put a lot of energy in to get the metal to dissociate or get to, to uh, break the bonds in the metal and, and melt it or uh, vaporize it. Here's another question. Metals typically have blank ionization energies than nonmetals. Try and answer that one. Okay, the answer to this is metals typically have lower ionization energies than nonmetals. Remember that there are certain periodic trends in the properties of the elements, and uh, we can read these off the periodic table. Um, and one such property is ionization energy, which is the energy required to rip an electron off of an atom. And metals, things that are on the left side of the periodic table, have low ionization energies. The nonmetals, that is the elements on the right side, have high ionization energies. And the way the trend goes is um, ionization energy increases as you go up in the periodic table and as you go to uh, the right across the periodic table. So the lowest ionization energies are at the bottom left and the highest ionization energies are at the top right. What about semiconductors? They conduct electricity better at higher temperatures. Why is that? Read the answers and answer this question, then I'll talk about it. Okay, they conduct better at higher temperature not because the electrons are moving faster and not because electrons can jump from molecular orbitals to atomic orbitals and not because electrons are promoted into the valence band. Remember the valence band is the lower energy band. What happens is some electrons in the valence band have enough energy to jump the band gap and get into the conduction band. The conduction band is the higher energy band where the electrons are free to move. So remember the difference between a semiconductor and a metal is that in the semiconductor the valence band is full. In the metal the valence band is not full. So when the valence band is full the only way an electron can move is to get into an empty orbital and in order to do it it has to jump up into the conduction band, that higher energy group of orbitals. And if the temperature is higher, then the electron has a little more energy to start with, and therefore it's a little easier for it to jump the band gap than if the temperature is low. And E is not a good answer. The entropy of the universe decreases. That never happens for any spontaneous process. So a reminder of how semiconductors can work. One of the things they do is produce uh, light emitting diodes. And the way that happens is you have a few electrons up in the conduction band. Well, you can get them up there by using an electric field, for example, and, and make them jump the band gap. And then when they fall back down into one of the, the holes that's left in the valence band because these electrons moved up, they fall back down. Energy is conserved, so where does the energy go? Well, it's emitted in the form of a photon. And we saw that in class. All right, let's talk about ionic materials. Ionic materials, like metals, are met network solids. Well, I guess I should mention that ionic materials form when you have a reaction between an element that's a metal and an element that's a nonmetal. So stuff from the left side of the periodic table reacting with stuff from the right side of the periodic table. And uh, these materials are network solids like metals, so you get an ordered array of metal and nonmetal atoms, just like shown in this picture, which is a, a little piece of a crystal of table salt, sodium chloride, which is an ionic material. Ionic materials are fragile crystals. Why are they that way? Well, it's because unlike metals, um, metallic materials, in ionic materials, the electrons belong to the various atoms. So some of the atoms are negatively charged and all the electrons belong to those. The, the non-metal becomes a negatively charged ion. Ions are charged atoms. The, the metal atoms lose electrons and they become positively charged ions. And that arrangement of plus and minus is critical. If you 
hit the crystal and misalign it a little bit so that you see that in the crystal right now we have plus touching minus uh, all the way through. But if you misalign it by one atom, you get plus against plus and minus against minus, and there's repulsion, and the, the crystal will shatter. Ionic materials form transparent and frequently colorless crystals. And again, that's because the electrons are localized and the orbitals in ionic materials are far apart in energy, not like metals where they're close together. Um, when you have these widely separated energy levels, that means that the material will only absorb at energies that correspond to the differences in energies of the energy levels. And um, in ionic materials, typically, those energy level differences are large such that the photons would be in the ultraviolet. And so uh, absorption of the ultraviolet doesn't affect the colors that we see. We, we, our eyes are not sensitive to the ultraviolet. However, if an ionic material has a transition metal ion in it, that is the metals in the middle of the periodic table, if those are part of these compounds, those kind of metal ions have d electrons which have closer together spaced orbitals those are close enough together that energy differences between them are in the visible range and so if you absorb visible light that adds color to the compound um, ionic materials are electrical insulators unless they're melted or in solution that is they don't uh, conduct electrical current and that's because when they are solid like this, the ions are locked into position and they can't move. Remember, an electrical current is a moving charge, and you can't move a charge through something like this um, unless you melt it. If you melt it, then the ions become mobile, mobile and the charge can move, and then you can carry current. Ionic materials have high melting and boiling points. And just as with metallic materials that we mentioned a second ago, um, the reason that the melting and boiling points are so high is because the bonding between these positive and negative charges in the crystal is very strong. And therefore, you have to put lots of energy in to break the bonds and allow the, the ionic materials to flow. And there are many examples of ionic materials. Sodium chloride is one. In sodium chloride, the, the sodium ions, the positively charged sodium atoms, the yellow ones, are about the same size as the negative charged chloride ions. But there are other situations. In something like aluminum oxide, again, it's a metal bound with a nonmetal. The aluminum ions, which are the little blue balls, are much smaller than the oxide ions, which are the big red balls. And so the ions have different charges. The aluminum is plus 3, and the oxide is minus 2. So different charges and different sizes. Or we get situations like in sodium oxide, where the sodium ions, which are the um, yellow balls, are plus 1 charge. They're about the same size as oxide ions, which are the red balls, which are minus 2. Uh, so we have similar sizes but different charges. And of course the whole formula has to end up being electrically neutral. It's not very hard to predict what ions usually form by looking at the periodic table. So this is an abbreviated view of the periodic table. And remember that the key is everything wants to have a noble gas electronic configuration. Remember the noble gases are the elements on the right side of the periodic table in that rightmost column. They are unreactive because they have filled electronic shells. So their s orbitals are full. You put two electrons per s orbital. And if they have p orbitals, as all of them do except for helium, the p orbitals are full. p orbitals come in sets of three. So there are six electrons that are in p orbitals, two in the s, which gives a total of eight. So they don't form ions, but the other materials all um, gain or lose electrons in order to get a noble gas electronic configuration. So the elements over here on the left, which you remember are metals, uh, 
tend to lose their valence electrons. In the first column, they lose one. And so the first column elements, hydrogen, lithium, sodium, potassium, and so on, all lose one electron and form plus one ions. The second column loses two to form plus two ions. Uh, boron and aluminum, which are across that transition gap, they tend to lose three to form plus three ions. The nonmetals, on the other hand, nearly have enough electrons to have a filled shell, so the easiest thing for them to do is to gain enough electrons to become noble. So this next to last column with fluorine and chlorine and bromine and iodine and so on, they're one electron short of a filled shell, and so if you add an electron, they get the noble gas configuration, and they form minus one ions. This column that has oxygen at the top is two electrons short of a filled shell. So they gain two electrons to form uh, minus two ions and have a noble gas configuration. The column with nitrogen at the top needs three electrons to get a filled shell, and so they form minus three ions. Then we've also talked about covalent materials. These are what we call molecular materials, and uh, they are typically materials that form when nonmetals bind with other nonmetals. Covalent materials can be solid, liquid, or gas at room temperature, and the reason for this is that the electrons are localized on the molecules. They're not spread out like they are in metallic materials, and because these things exist as molecules, it's the forces between the molecules that are critical. So when a covalent material uh, melts, um, you don't break bonds within the molecule. You make bonds, you break bonds between the molecules. So the little diagram over here on the right depicts a crystal of ice. The solid lines are the chemical bonds in the water molecules, and the dotted lines are intermolecular interactions. These are hydrogen bonds, which are weak interactions. But that's what holds the ice together. Um, as, we, as weak interactions or as intermolecular forces go, these are among the stronger ones, and that's why water has a relatively high melting point and relatively high boiling point. Covalent materials are frequently transparent and colorless materials, and the reason for this is the same as it is in the ionic materials we just talked about. It's because the orbitals are far apart in energy. And so in order for electrons to jump from one orbital to another, they have to absorb energetic photons, which are in the ultraviolet and don't cause color. Um, sometimes you can have covalent materials that have energy levels that are closer together and when those transitions happen, you absorb in the visible and cause uh, the production of color. Covalent materials are typically electrically insulating materials. That is, they don't conduct electricity. And the reason is, again, the same as we saw for ionic materials, because the electrons are localized on the molecules, and therefore there's no way to have charge move. So neutral molecules moving around can't carry a net charge. Um, covalent materials have a wide range of melting and boiling points, which is implied by the fact that they're solid liquid or gas at room temperature. And the reason for this is that there's a very wide range of strengths of intermolecular forces. And so if you have strong intermolecular forces, the melting and boiling points will be high. But if the intermolecular forces are weak, then they will be uh, low. Keep in mind that these covalent materials involve sharing of electrons, but the sharing is not equal. Some atoms are better at hanging on to electrons than others. The ability to attract electrons is a property called electronegativity, and this is another one that you can predict by looking at the periodic table. Electronegativity increases as you go up on the periodic table and as you go to the right on the periodic table, but ignore the noble gases. They don't have a defined electronegativity. So this little map shows how the electronegativity trends go. The things with the lowest electronegativities will be down here at the bottom left, so stuff like cesium.
and the stuff with the highest electronegativities will be up here at the top right, things like fluorine and oxygen, very high electronegativity. Those intermolecular interactions come in many uh, forms, and this is just a, a summary of them, kind of in order of how strong they are. So the weakest intermolecular forces or interactions are called dispersion forces. Um, these numbers down here are relative measures of how strong they are. So remember dispersion happens because the electron clouds around the atoms are um, fluctuating all the time and there are times when one end of the molecule or the atom has extra electrons and becomes slightly negative the other end of the atom or molecule that at the same time becomes slightly positive and plus minus pairings between different molecules are lower in energy than plus plus or minus minus and so the plus minus pairings happen a little more frequently and that means all atoms stick to each other but not very well. The next strongest type of interaction in general is a dipole-dipole interaction that's the interaction you get when the molecules are polar. So these molecules are formaldehyde molecules. And in formaldehyde, you have an electronegative oxygen atom up here, the red ball, bound to a less electronegative carbon atom, the, the gray one down here. And that means that the oxygen end of the molecule has a small partial negative charge always. And the carbon end of the molecule has a small positive charge always and this colored rainbow thing around the outside of the molecule is a, a picture of the surface of the molecule color coded according to charge so red is negative and blue is positive so the difference is in dispersion those charge distributions are temporary and changing all the time but in a polar molecule a molecule that has a dipole uh, it's permanent. It's always negative on the oxygen end and always positive on the carbon end, for instance, in formaldehyde. When you have that situation and you have more than one molecule around, well, the negative end of one molecule will be attracted to the positive end of the other one, and we call that a dipole-dipole interaction. These kinds of interactions are five to ten times stronger than the dispersion interactions. And sometimes they're very strong. The special case is called hydrogen bonding. Hydrogen bonding occurs in molecules where you have a very electronegative atom, namely oxygen, nitrogen, or fluorine, bound to a very low electronegativity atom, namely hydrogen. So you have to have hydrogen attached to oxygen, nitrogen, or fluorine to get this kind of hydrogen bonding. It's just a very strong kind of dipole-dipole interaction, 30 to 150 kilojoules per mole, so you know, 3 to 15 times stronger than dipole-dipole itself. And all of these interactions tend to be much weaker than covalent bonds within molecules. Don't confuse bonding between molecules, which is called intermolecular, with bonding within molecules, which is called intramolecular. So covalent bonds are much stronger than any of these intermolecular interactions. And for that matter, uh, ionic bonds and metallic bonds are also of this way. They're much stronger than these intermolecular forces, typically. Okay. I need to mention one other thing. It's possible to make molecules that have net positive or negative charges. So within it's a molecule, but because the molecule has a charge, we also call it an ion. So the way this works is you get a stronger covalent bond if the number of electrons on the molecule doesn't match the total nuclear charge. That means that the resulting molecule is charged. And um, examples of molecules that do this are things like nitrate, which has a negative charge, or sulfate, which has two negative charges, or silicate, which has four negative charges, or ammonium, which has a single positive charge. So um, these things are ions, and these molecules can stick to each other via ionic bonding. Isn't this kind of complicated? So the charged molecules assemble themselves together and make ionic crystals. Um, so things like sodium nitrate and 
ammonium chloride are examples of things that do that. So you get mixtures of molecular and um, molecular behavior or covalent behavior and ionic behavior in the same compounds, interestingly enough. Okay, let's finish up the review. Um, what I want to do is talk a little bit about some different molecules. These are all ones we've talked about in class and just show how their macroscopic properties are related to their microscopic chemical structure. So the first one I'll do now is glucose, which is a kind of sugar, and its properties are listed here. It's crystalline. Um, you all know about rock candy, which is crystallized sugar. Uh, it is a molecular solid. It melts when you heat it up and then decomposes if you get it too hot. So it'll go syrupy first and then become brown or black tar. And we all know sugars, glucose included, are sticky. What does that have to do with the molecular structure that's shown over here? Well, uh, you can see that glucose has lots of hydrogens, the little white balls, attached to oxygens, the little red balls. And therefore, glucose is a molecule that's capable of hydrogen bonding. And the glucose molecules will hydrogen bond to each other and therefore easily make beautiful molecular crystals. Those hydrogen bonds add up and that means that it's hard to pull the glucose molecules apart. When they're hard to pull apart, that makes uh, the melting point relatively high compared even to water, which hydrogen bonds very well. And then the fact that those hydrogen bonding groups are all over the molecule also makes it sticky because it will hydrogen bond with things like the proteins in your sugar or uh, <laughs> the proteins in your fingers or your skin. Uh, so that's what makes glucose sticky. Diamond is another example. Diamond is a form of pure carbon and as we know a diamond is very hard. It's a beautiful crystalline solid. Uh, diamonds are usually colorless and diamonds, if you heat them up, never melt. They just decompose. You can burn them, but uh, you can't make liquid diamond. Why is that? Well, the structure of diamond is shown over here, and diamond is a covalent network material. And so, as we said in class, a single diamond is like a giant molecule, and each carbon atom in a diamond, mo in a diamond or diamond molecule, if you will, is covalently bonded to four other carbon atoms. Uh, all of them are that way except the ones that are on the surface of the diamond. So in this little example here, it's hard to see that because we see a lot of surface. Um, but what that means is diamond is very hard because to uh, distort the diamond or to cut it, you have to break covalent bonds that are quite strong. And because it's held together by these very strong covalent bonds, it can't melt. Uh, the only thing you can do is break the covalent bonds, and if you do, then you don't have diamond anymore. You have something else. Uh, that's decomposition. Why is diamond colorless? Well, it's because there are no low-lying, unoccupied molecular orbitals. Remember, for a material to have color, it has to absorb photons in the vis visible range of the spectrum. And to do that, you have to have empty molecular orbitals that electrons can jump into that uh, are fairly low in energy or low enough in energy that they correspond to visible photons and diamond doesn't have any. We can contrast diamond with graphite which is also pure carbon. Graphite unlike diamond is soft. It's the stuff in pencil lead. Uh, like diamond it's crystalline but the crystals tend to be very small and graphite has a, a dark color. It's black. So why is it so different? I mean, it's the same stuff. It's carbon, right? Well, it's not the same stuff. Even though it is all carbon, the carbon atoms are arranged differently in graphite than they are in diamond. In diamond, there's a complete uh, three-dimensional covalent network. The structure shown over here illustrates how uh, carbon behaves. And in carbon, um, each carbon atom is bonded to three other carbon atoms and the bonding is in flat sheets, flat sheets like that. So within those flat sheets, those planes of carbon atoms, uh, 
the carbon atoms are held together very strongly. So that's why graphite is a good structural material and it's used to build high performance aircraft and fancy golf clubs and stuff like that. Because within the sheets, the bonding is quite strong. But those planes of atoms are held together by very weak intermolecular forces. So um, the planes are held together to each other. Or the atoms within the plane are held together very strongly, but the planes can slide over each other very easily because the bonding is extremely weak. And that's what makes graphite soft and a good lubricant. Um, and in graphite, there are lots of empty, uh, low-lying molecular orbitals, and therefore graphite can absorb light of many wavelengths, including many visible wavelengths, and that's why it looks black it just absorbs all the light. Another form of pure carbon is Buckminster Fullerene, um, named after the architect Buckminster Fuller. What kind of material is this? Would you call this a, um, an element or a compound? What would it be? Well, I think you can see that it's an element because there's only one kind of atom in the Buckminster Fullerene. It's all carbon. Um, and it's a molecular material because these are molecules. They're not networks. Uh, they have a finite size. What would you predict the properties of Buckminster fullerene to be, given that this is the structure? Well, it's got carbon atoms in these sheets where each carbon is bonded to three other carbon atoms. So you might expect it to be kind of like graphite in that uh, it ought to be soft and ought to be stuff that absorbs at many different wavelengths of, of light. And if that was your prediction, that would be correct. That's how Buckminster fullerene is. Uh, it is a molecular material. It will form crystals that are composed of these soccer ball shaped uh, molecules, um, but pretty interesting stuff. And now you know enough chemistry that looking at a structure, you might be able to form some ideas correctly of what the properties of the material should be. Uh, I didn't do this demonstration, but I want to talk about it a little bit. Um, it's called elephant toothpaste, and in the I think I might have talked about it in class. Um, in the demonstration, you take hydrogen peroxide and mix it up with dish soap, and then you throw some potassium iodide in it, and as soon as you do, the hydrogen peroxide starts to decompose. It makes water vapor and oxygen and that's gas and so the dish soap foams up and you get a big production of lots of foam coming out and uh, if you do it in a large vessel like a large uh, test tube it looks like elephant sized toothpaste. And uh, the reason this happens is well I'll let you try to answer it and then I'll give you the answer. Okay ready? Um, what happens is the iodide is a catalyst, and A describes how catalysts work. It says the reaction sped up because iodide made available a new, lower energy or more favorable entropy pathway to the products, and that's true. B says the reaction sped up because iodide catalyst, catalyzed it, that's also true. So the best answer to this is C, both of the above. So you did learn about catalysis, and if you don't remember that, please go back and review it. We talked about properties of uh, fatty acids, and here are a bunch of fatty acids. And you remember we compared ones that have straight chains, like these molecules on uh, the left of the screen, to others that have the kinky chains. If you look closely, remember the kinks are caused by double bonds where you have a double bond between those two carbons and only one hydrogen on each of those carbons, whereas most of them have two. Remember that to get a kinky chain, you actually have to have what we call a cis double bond. Cis meaning that the two hydrogens are on the same side of the carbon. Cis is from the Greek word for same. Um, if you have a trans double bond where the hydrogens are on opposite sides, it actually helps to make the molecule straighter than it would be otherwise. Uh, we talked about saturated fatty acids, which are ones that don't have any multiple bonds in their hydrocarbon chains, versus unsaturated fatty acids, which are ones that have double bonds or multiple bonds. And 
We also talked about monounsaturated, where there's one multiple bond, versus polyunsaturated, like these molecules down here, where there are multiple uh, double bonds. And of course, the more unsaturated a molecule is, the more kinked the chain is. And we saw in class how having that kinky chain means that the molecules can't stack up against themselves very easily. And therefore, they end up uh, being much easier to melt. So they tend to be liquid at room temperature and more healthy than you, for you than these straight chain molecules which can stack against each other and stick to each other quite well and uh, tend to have high melting points so that they are solids at room temperature and they do that in your body too and form solid fats and block your arteries and do bad things. And then of course the, the trans fatty acids are the worst of all because they have straighter chains that stack even better than the uns than the unsat sorry than the saturated ones do, and on top of that, the enzymes in the body are not able to process that straight chain that you get in a trans fat, whereas they can process saturated fatty acids and they process cis fatty acids just fine, and so those artificially made trans fats just tend to build up in your body and cause problems. We also talked about silicate minerals, where SiO4, 4 minus, is the silicate ion. And uh, we talked about how you can arrange silicate in different ways. It can be in the mineral as isolated units, in which case you have to have some metal ions that are positively charged to balance out the negative charge from the silicate. You can also share oxygens on the corners of the silicate ions and form chains or double chains, and minerals that are this way tend to have uh, fibrous structures. I forgot to mention that the isolated unit ones, they tend to be ionic materials that are crystalline. And uh, so anyway, if you share oxygens, you don't need as many metal ions to balance out the charge. And you can also share oxygens to form sheets like this. and uh, the flat sheet kind of linkage of silicate makes minerals that have flat sheets like micas. Uh, or you can share uh, all of the oxygens to make a network material like quartz, which is chunky. So these give um, crystals, these give fibrous materials, these give sheet-like materials, and the one that's not shown, the three-dimensional network gives chunky materials. Oops, there we go. Oh, here's uh, an example of the of the chunky materials. This is the way uh, silica is in sand. Networks that are connected equally in all directions, so this would be a network solid, which you would expect to, to be strong, kind of like diamond, and it is. We talked about nuclear power and nuclear power production by converting matter into energy by taking advantage of the potential energy that's released when you make changes in a nucleus that involve the strong nuclear force. So the products of a nuclear reaction always weigh less than the reactants with the difference in mass being what was converted into energy. Uh, elements lighter than iron undergo nuclear fusion and release energy. That is, you combine two nuclei together to make a heavier nucleus, and that is downhill in energy, so the fusion process releases energy up to iron. Elements heavier than iron uh, have to split in order to release energy. Um, that's called nuclear fission. Fusion is what happens in the sun, and to do fusion we use hydrogen, Actually, what we really want to use is the deuterium isotope of hydrogen, so the one that's got one extra neutron, and that is fairly plentiful in seawater. So there's lots of fuel for nuclear fusion in the ocean. The products are helium and energy, so helium is inert, and that doesn't cause any environmental problems. In fact, we can use helium for other things we need, like uh, keeping magnetic resonance image, uh, imaging magnets cold. Um, but forcing positively charged nuclei, and all nuclei are positively charged, 
forcing them together is hard because you have to overcome the electromagnetic repulsion between the nuclei. And so doing controlled fusion is difficult. Right now it costs just about as much energy as it produces. And so fusion is not a viable power source on the Earth, although it happens in, in stars like the Sun. And ultimately, nearly all the energy we have on the Earth comes from the fusion of uh, hydrogen into helium in the Sun. Nuclear fission is what we use when we make nuclear power. Here's an example of a fission reaction where we add a slow neutron to uranium-235, which causes it to become unstable so that it splits and becomes xenon-140 and strontium-94 and two neutrons. Those neutrons can be slowed down and cause the same reaction to happen in two more uranium atoms until you get a nuclear chain reaction. Nuclear fission has been done on the Earth in controlled fashion since the early 1940s. During World War II it was developed. And the fuels for fission are plentiful on the Earth. Uh, it's uranium. And we also know how to make more of it by using a nuclear reactor. And fission is currently economically competitive with burning fossil fuel. So why don't we have more nuclear power plants? There are about well, a few over 100 in the United States operating right now. Why don't we use fission more? Well, because they make radioactive isotopes, like strontium-94 is nasty radioactive stuff. Um, and you have to dispose of that waste somehow, and the waste stays radioactive for tens of thousands of years. And no one has really solved the waste disposal problem. Um, it's been talked about putting it down in salt mines in Nevada. I think that's probably a pretty good idea, but then you have to transport it, and it's dangerous when it's in transport. And what if the train derails? Or what if, uh, what if terrorists get hold of it? That could be a problem. There's a lot of fear that prevents the use and expansion of nuclear fission because there have been some pretty significant nuclear uh, accidents. Uh, the one in Chernobyl in the Ukraine contaminated a large part of the country with radiation, and it's still... Um, uninhabitable. Three Mile Island in the United States also had a, a significant radiation release but uh, that didn't really hurt anybody but it scared a lot of people. And then just a few years ago there was a, a bad nuclear accident at the, the Fukushima nuclear power plant in Japan uh, after an earthquake and a tsunami um, disabled the reactors and there was a core meltdown and explosion and uh, a large area around there is still, um, is still too radioactive for people to live. We also worry about proliferation of nuclear weapons because good fuels for nuclear fission plants can be processed into good material for making nuclear fission bombs like the ones that destroyed Hiroshima and Nagasaki. All right, well that concludes what I have to say about the PS100 Exam 3 review. Keep in mind that this review is not going to be sufficient. You need to do more than, um, than just listen to this review. You need to go back and look through your notes and work as many problems as you can, um, especially conceptual problems, multiple choice type problems like the ones in the back of the book or the ones you can see at the PS100 website online like I've assigned. And that should help you. Good luck on the exam and I will see you on Thursday night.